problem here with regulation in, in Mexico and so many other places where these, inter, these industries, these hazardous industries, lead and others, are now being concentrated. China is another. The rules on the books look good, but when you go into the factory, uh, it's a lot like Alice Hamilton's time. The regulators are not there. They're not effective. Uh, and so that's, that's a big issue, I think, uh, that will face uh, in, worldwide in terms of this whole problem of occupational disease over, over the coming years, too. Uh, now, uh, finally, I think there's a problem of unevenness of knowledge that we need to think about. Uh, and that Hamilton's legacy can help us to address, I think. Uh, because of the very sophisticated, the very sophistication of our scientific knowledge now, this gap between what the experts know and what is known by workers or the public at large has become huge considerably larger than in Alice Hamilton's time. And Hamilton's time is relatively easy to explain to a layperson how to recognize lead poisoning. But as this chart indicates, many of these things that we now consider to be lead's pathology, you can only see them with a laboratory, with laboratory measurements. And they're, they're, they're subtle, they're, they're devastating, they can be. Uh, but you, you can only see them also over the long term. That's the other dimension that the new sciences have opened up. And so this gap between our expertise and uh, lay knowledge has become uh, really formidable. And uh, a couple of examples of how that's worked and some of the things I've been looking into. Uh, you can already see it yawning in this time of Alandrican study in the, in the early 70s. Once they find the results that they, they, they do, uh, they decide that they must remove all the people from smelter tanks. Uh, but what happens? How do they do this? They, ho they hold a meeting and they tell all the people in smelter town they're being poisoned. At the same time, they tell them, you've got to move out of all your houses. This community must be raised. What kind of effect is that going to have? Well, people, this is the, the, I, I, going in there and interviewing people even today, that legacy is long and that anger and hurt from that intervention are very well remembered in people who were there. Uh, particularly on the receiving end of this message. So I think that that gap it, between what these scientists had seen and concluded uh, and what and, and the way it was brought to the people who are actually the victims being affected uh, is something that, that becomes ever more problematic, uh, precisely as your science gets this sophisticated and this sort of uh, uh, abstract and, and a little bit esoteric as well. Um, and so communication becomes ever more important. Another place that, uh, I mean, I also see it, see uh, just one other example is that in terms of believing in these effects, you go and talk with people, not just in Mexico, but in El Paso, who are also being exposed today. And you realize how little of this knowledge is out there uh, in these communities. Uh, it's really quite striking. Lead, lead, does, lead poisoning, and the, the, particularly chronic lead poisoning, doesn't really have an, a, a reality for people. And they say, well, uh, you know, I don't really believe it, 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 it could be having all these effects because, and then they jump to, well, look at all the Sarko has done for our community and this kind of thing. But there is a level of disbelief out among the public that I think is, 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 a, is a legacy of this change in what investigation means. Uh, in occupational health. Uh, so, legacy of Alice Hamilton has been far-reaching. I hope that in, in work on these as in other fronts, it will continue to build. To the end of her life, Hamilton remained largely unaware, especially of these longer-term and chronic effects. And uh, these have, even as these have now become the focus of much occupational and environmental health research, Yet it was her success at both science and profession building that laid the groundwork for what Landrigan was able to achieve. Um, in a funny way, her industrial hygiene also helped to make the modern chemical industry possible. It helped shore up, if, if also to limit the legal recourse of the stricken, and bolstered public confidence in our ability that, to cope with these hazards, however misplaced that confidence. Um, um, so I think, though, that uh, 
with, without the certainty that Hamilton ushered uh, into America's understanding of lead work and without the additional certainties about the toxic effects of industrial chemicals that had been made plain by this century of, of, of industrial hy hygiene science building, we would not even be speaking of the need to keep alive these other sides to, uh, of her legacy. But for all these, I think we owe Alice Hamilton a debt of gratitude. Thank you. minutes to take questions and again there will be a panel discussion and, and other opportunities for questions as well but um, if there are specific questions about what you've just heard we'd love to hear them I think because we're videotaping we'd like you to use the microphone though so Eduardo I've been following Alice Hamilton for a long time and what I have not yet figured out is what's her politics because we talk a lot about the science, but a person like her could not have done this without a strong sense of something, politically. And I tried to figure out who she read, what, who were around her, what kind of radical ideas were around her, because she would not have done this without some other more profound ideas of society that no. I would like to hear from you. Oh, sure. I, I mean, that's, that's actually a part, a part of the what this, what my book was about, that I edited it out a little bit for matters of time and to make the connection with today. But it, it really is interesting. Uh, and there's a divide that opens up on the, the question of politics between her and her more laboratory-oriented colleagues. Can, can you hear? Is this, is this working? In the 1920s and 1930s, and I think is part of the, the reason why there's this tension between the two groups. Um, on the one hand, Alice Hamilton is, is pretty involved in labor politics. She's an advocate. She writes for uh, popular magazines, taking positions on legislation, on you know, workers' compensation, on a ban on, on ILO, rec the International Labor Organization recommends that, that, that there's a ban on white lead paint. And Hamilton ac actively advocates for that. Uh, and, and in fact, if you go and look at the look at the sort of the letters of these Harvard folks who were sort of saying, well, she didn't go in the lab enough, they're also saying, well, look at what she advocated. You know, she she got off on this white lead band thing, and that's really not what what we should be about as professionals and so on. So there is, I mean, on, on the one hand, she's she did also talk about objectivity as in being important for the credibility of of occupational health expertise and she has a lot to say about that about not being you know, seen as too much pro union as well as too much pro business uh, but on the other hand she is really willing to, to to go out there in the public arena and take sides on particular legislation that she feels is 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 important and fundamental to uh, to what she's committed to which is worker worker health and the protection of, of workers so it is really, and she also gets involved in other things like the peace movement in this time period of World War I. Uh, so she has other involvements in the political realm too that are not directly connected to occupational health. But there, she, she is uh, uh, in many ways uh, much more activist and represents a more activist generation, I think, than, than uh, most industrial hygienists felt comfortable with. Uh, from the 1930s to the 1950s. It's almost like we go through these generations where you have one generation that establishes institutions and so on that is more savvy politically and also more engaged politically and then you have another that comes along sort of uh, on, on their heels and, and taking for granted their accomplishments.